Okay, so if your phones are on silent and no annoying ringtones, let's start. So we're going on with Mark 5. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, through the Lord, we come to you and we pray for your, your special presence with us and that we might again meet the Lord Jesus, as it were, meeting him for the first time again. We pray, Father, that you will make him real to each of us and that as we read the pages of the Gospels that we might see that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, as well as forever in the future. We pray that we might know him, and that we might make him known, and that we might identify with him and be his, and live our whole lives in the atmosphere of breathing him and his spirit and his ways. For his sake, amen. Right, so I'm going to read through um, the last bit of Mark 5. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great crowd was gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. You're going to see that that wasn't actually totally true, but I'll come to that a bit later. She had died. I beg you to come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made whole and live. Jesus went with him, and a great crowd followed at him, and they pressed upon him, touching him. And a woman who for twelve years had an issue of blood, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, having heard the things about Jesus, came from the crowd behind him and touched his garment. The other Gospels say she touched the hem of his garment, and Jews had to have a... Uh, a, a, a blue ribbon at the bottom of their, of their robe that represented righteousness. So, she touches that. Because, verse 28, she said inside herself, if I touch but his garments, I shall be made whole. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her illness. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned towards the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Loads of people have been touching me. His disciples said to him, You saw the crowd pressing on you, and you asked, Who touched me? Like, duh. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had been done to her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be free of your illness. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying, Your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further? But Jesus, not heeding the word spoken, said to the ruler of the synagogue, Fear not, only believe. Remember we said yesterday, the opposite of, of, not believe, the opposite of faith is fear. And he permitted no one to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult and many weeping and wailing greatly. And Matthew's record says they'd even got the flute players there. So, you see, the girl had died and had been dead for some time. That's why they had the flute players, and these weepers, these mourners, were hired to come and mourn. So that when the ruler of the synagogue says, oh, my daughter's about to die, actually she's been dead for a while. But, you see, the Lord is gracious in the same way as it's not wise to pay attention to every lie that people tell you, you know? You phone someone and say, oh, you know, can I come and see you tonight? Oh, oh you know what? I don't know, my, my mother-in-law died yesterday, or my, my cat died, or, you know, anything. oh, yeah, as if. Um, but, you know, he doesn't pay attention to that. He sees through all that, mm -hmm. surface level. Surface level sin, if, if you like. I'm not saying sin's not sin. I'm not saying it's okay to tell porkies, but I'm just saying. So, but he said, why are you making a tumult and weep? The child is not dead but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. So you see, these women who have been paid to come and professionally mourn for a dead girl, suddenly they turn around and start laughing at him. So they were just professionals. But he, having put them outside, took the father of the child and her mother and those that were with him, and went to where the child was. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, rise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. How old was she? She was twelve. And how many years had the woman with the issue of blood been suffering? 
12 years. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. That sticks in my mind. That, you see, he's so thoughtful. She's been dead, right? Mm -hmm. And she's been sick before that. And now she's alive. The kid's starving hungry. And everyone's, oh, yeah, yeah, darling little girl is alive. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, okay, guys, but the kid's hungry. She's been dead, right? She didn't eat. You don't eat when you're dead. And his sensitivity to human situations, absolutely amazing. And you see, I tell you, Jesus Christ is real. He is real. And he is the same today as he was yesterday. You, you meet him in the pages of the Gospels. That this Jesus who is so sensitive to a human situation, there's a kid who's been dead, she gets resurrected, and the parents are, oh, wow, wow, wow. He's like, guys, she's hungry. Give her something to eat, can you? Chuck her a banana or something. The kid's starving hungry. Wow. You know, master, Lord, master and saviour. Absolutely the master of the situation. And he is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's not changed. He's just as active. So, let's go back. 22. He lands on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and one of the rulers of the synagogue called Jairus comes to him. Again, I keep saying, you've got to put the scriptures together. When you read this in Matthew, he says that Jesus got off the boat and there was a whole mass of crowds of people waiting for him and he starts teaching them. So this guy had to sort of fight his way to the front. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He was what you might call a rabbi of the synagogue. And later on, when the Jews are talking about Jesus and mocking him, they say, none of the rulers of the synagogues believed in him, did they? There's a ruler of the synagogue who did. And in John's Gospel, the comment is made that a number of the rulers of the synagogues did believe, but they were scared to confess that Jesus was Messiah, lest they get beat up by the other Jews. So, you see, this guy is the one who comes out in front of the whole crowd in this little town that they lived in, and these were small places. You can go to the Sea of Galilee today and go to all these little places like Tiberius, Capernaum, but they were small places. Collections of houses, all oh, weren't big places. Everyone knew each other. So it's his need that drives him to come out. And that's what we've got to do to come out for Jesus. But you're only driven to that by need, by your desperation. He falls at the Lord's feet and begs him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. As I say, the fact they already had flute players and professional mourners at the house means she gone. She's dead. He knew that. But he, he lies. But, all right. I beg you to come and lay your hands on her that she may be made whole and live. You see how Jesus is not a legalist. He doesn't say, oh, wow, you know, uh, you, you told me a lie. You said your daughter's about to die when actually she's already dead. No, no deal. I'm not helping you. You, you lied to me. You lied to the Son of God. Who do you think you are? No. He's wiser than that and he's more gracious than that. And as I say, this is the Jesus with whom we have to do today. So, I beg you to come and lay your hands on her that she may be whole and live. He is making slightly the same mistake as the woman did, who we've just read about, who thinks that she's got to touch the hem of the garment to be healed. Like this guy, he thinks... Oh, if only there's physical touch from Jesus, then I'm going to get the miracle. It's a bit like in some, uh, you know, religions today, they believe that if you touch something holy, if you touch a crucifix, if you touch an icon, you're going to get blessing. And it's not like that. God is also primitive. Oh, touch wood, people say, oh, touch wood. Like, is that going to help you? Is that going to change any outcomes? Going to change anything? 
But Jesus goes along with this. He doesn't say, no, no, you've got it all wrong. It's very gentle. Jesus <coughs> went with him, and a great crowd followed him, and they pressed on him. And a woman who for 12 years had an issue of blood. I said that the little girl who's died and the Lord resurrects was 12 years old. And this woman has for 12 years been hemorrhaging blood. Now don't forget this is Israel and Palestine in the first century. Jewish folks, we have a, a, a sense about blood that you, 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 you mustn't touch blood. Blood is like not clean and all that sort of thing. Right? And so, <laughs> this, uh, this woman is hemorrhaging blood. She was totally unclean, but according to the law of Moses, she would have been trying to conceal this so that people, you know, didn't think she was like this because whoever touched her was made unclean. Well, you see the parallel lines. The, the girl had been, was 12 years old and this woman had for 12 years been hemorrhaging blood. And so you see parallel lives. God had been at work in the life of the 12 year old girl for her 12 little years of her life until she died. And he'd been at work in this poor woman who was hemorrhaging blood and was seen by everybody as unclean. And you see that in your life, that you meet people who, incredibly enough, have had very similar experiences to you. I've had this a number of times, where I have thought, you know, certain things happen to me, it would be a waste of time telling you, because you would not understand. And then, well, for some reason, you're having a coffee with someone or you're chatting with someone and you do tell them. Or maybe they are talking to you and they tell you and they say, look, I know you won't believe this, but you see such and such happened to me, I had this situation in my life. And you're thinking, wow. And I thought that I was unique. I thought that what I went through, nobody else would have experienced. There you are. And you see, that is the... One reason we have church, because it's not to come and, you know, just chat about, you know, state of the nation and all that stuff, but to actually connect with each other and to see that actually man is not alone. Because our experiences that we considered were so unique that no one else ever touched this, yeah, someone else did. Because the same big hand of God was working in their life as in your life. And this then is the basis of Christian fellowship, that the same hand has been working in your life, my life, her life, his life, their lives, etc. So she'd suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. So she's desperate. She's had it, really. Uh, she's not got any, mo any money left. She had something because she spent all that she had. So maybe she'd had an inheritance or she had something. She wasn't totally poor. But now she was because she'd spent it. You see? She had spent all that she had. So she had something. She wasn't like sleeping rough from, from like a kid. She had something, but she spent it. Tried this one, tried that one. This is all of us. This woman, all these people you encounter in the Gospels, are all very similar to us. So, she touches his garment, and as I say, it's the ribbon of blue that is in view. She touches that hem of his garment. For she said, this is her self-talk, if I touch his garments, I will be made whole. Now, the blue ribbon on the bottom of the garments represented righteousness. And that is a strange prophecy in Malachi about the Lord Jesus, about Messiah, that, that says that there will be healing in his hems, in the hem of his garments. And she understood that. And the other thing you notice is that she said inside herself, and here, 2,000 years later, you are reading of the internal self-talk 
of a woman who had a blood problem who lived 2,000 years ago. You see how critically important self-talk is to God. Many times in the Bible you read that somebody said something inside their heart, inside their own head. We all have self-talk. We all talk to ourselves. doesn't mean you're crazy that you talk to yourself. It's normal. Right? And that is the core and the essence of personality. That is who you essentially are. How you talk to yourself. You know, you're walking down a, a street and you, you're cussing this bloke and calling that bloke a, a moron and calling that woman a whatever and uh, this went wrong and that went wrong. Oh, whoops, I just, uh, just dropped my coffee. Oh, blah, blah. Yeah, trundling through life like that, hey, that's all your self-talk. And you see, that's what God is so interested in, because that is the essence of what it is to be a Christian, you see. It's not about going to church and, you know, showing yourself right once a week, once a month, once a year. It's what your self-talk is in your own head. And that is why we so need the gift of the Holy Spirit, a holy mind. The Spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ. This is all talking about the same thing. Not jumping up and down and doing miracles or this stuff, but his mind. That's why I beg people to get baptised. Because how do we take hold of the hem of Jesus? Like she grabbed hold of, the, of him, of his garments, his righteousness. You do it by making that act of identity with him. You see... You know, we do the baptism back at our place in South Croydon in the bathtub. When you go under the water, that's like death with Jesus. And when you come up out of the water, that's like resurrection with him. That's how it is. And I've, I've seen the, the total change in people's lives who got baptised. Because he that is born of water and of the Spirit will enter the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord taught. So you see, when you're baptised in water, then... You receive this gift of his spirit, of his mind. It's not all immediate, because growth by its nature is not immediate. You don't see a child growing, you know, millimetres per day. You just notice over time, oh wow, my David has uh, shot up by, uh, oh yeah, by 10 centimetres. Um, and so it is with spiritual growth. It's not immediate, but you've got to make a start. You've got to make a start. And... I'm free actually today because Cindy's picking the kids up. Come back to my place and be baptised. That's a challenge to you. Corinne and maybe Lynn and Cindy would come back, cup of coffee, cakes, baptism. And I'll bring you back to Croydon afterwards. Anyway, <clears throat> so she touches him. And immediately the fountain of her blood, that is her bleeding, was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her illness. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned to the crowd who were all touching him and said, Who touched me? Of course he knew. He knew it was that woman. But he asks the question to help her come out for him. <coughs> it's like in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned. God walks in the garden and says, Where are you? It's not that he didn't know where they were. He knew full well where they were. Where are you? And it's the same here. He says, so, so who touched me? The disciples said, duh. They've all been touching you. Oh, what a stupid question, Lord. As you read the Gospels, you find a lot of criticism of the disciples. Like here. No, duh. But then, who wrote the Gospels? And what are the Gospels? So when we started looking at the Gospel of Mark, I said that, in my opinion, the four Gospels are, if you like, a transcript of how the disciples, Mark or maybe Peter, uh, how they preached the Gospel. And over time, that was written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We don't write the Gospels, the Gospel according to Mark. This is the story Mark or Peter used to tell. Gospel according to Luke, it's the story Luke used to tell. Gospel of Matthew, it's what Matthew used to tell. And so when they are critical of the disciples, they're critical of themselves. So in their witness to people, they're saying, you know what? We were so stupid. We didn't get it. But we do now. And that is what persuades people. That we show chinks in our armour. You know, people are sick and tired of you know, some perfect pastor, very beautifully dressed up, 
and with uh, you know beautiful you know supposedly obedient children and uh, the, uh, the the smarmy smiling wife and all that stuff or or the priest that's all dressed up beautifully and all that people are sick and tired of all that because no the more real the more credible that's the thing <clears throat> so he looked around to see who had done this thing that was not because he thought, now is it you, is it her, is it him? He knew. He wanted her to come out. Just as Jairus, the synagogue ruler, had to fight his way through the crowd and in his own home village in front of the crowd say, excuse me sir, would you please, I beg you, I believe that you can raise my daughter, can you please come to my house? And a city set on a hill cannot be hid. As we said the other day, if you light a candle and put it under a, a bucket, it will go out. And so we are the light that's been lit, and we are intended to shine forth. And that is why life just goes the way it does, and uh, you have to stand up for your faith, because it's for our benefit. So, verse 33, the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had been done to her, came and fell down before him, just like the ruler of the synagogue. So these two very different women, uh, people. The ruler of the synagogue, who was like a, the, the, the rabbi in the village, everybody knew him, and this woman, who probably didn't go to the synagogue because she was out of church, because she was hemorrhaging blood, she was unclean, probably couldn't find anyone willing to rent a room to her because, oh, you're unclean. So, different lives, but parallel. So she told him all the truth, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Your faith. She thought, that, and she did believe, but she had this idea that is there in sort of orthodox churches, that if I touch, if I touch the icon, if I touch the crucifix, if I touch wood, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be saved. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I know you thought that. You, you're trying to touch me, but look, your faith, not touching me. Loads of people touch me, but they didn't have faith. You touched me, but you had faith, and that's why you're being healed. I just love how gentle the Lord was. He didn't say, oh no, if you, if you're in all that thing about thinking, oh, if only I physically touch Jesus, I'm gonna get cured. No, no, I don't play ball with that, and I'll see you later. No, no, he, he, he's working with people, and with you and with me, in all our weakness and dysfunction and misunderstanding. <coughs> well, while he's still speaking, someone came from the, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying, your daughter's dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further, or the master any further? Well, who were those people? Well, we don't exactly know, but... <clears throat> The only people in the Gospels who call Jesus the master or the teacher are his disciples. And several times the disciples say to people, don't trouble the master. Like they say to that uh, Gentile woman who wanted to be cured, they said, stop, stop bothering him. When the women kept bringing their kids to Jesus to bless them, they said, stop troubling the master. So I wonder again if this is the disciples being self-critical. So no, it's, no. The, the girl is dead. Stop wasting the time. Don't be time wasting for Jesus. But Jesus would not listen to that. And he sees the ruler of the synagogue is starting to go down in his faith. They come and they say, no, 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 the, your daughter's dead. Jesus can't do anything now. He can't cure her. She's dead. But I think... Jesus notices that the guy's faith is going down. That's why he says, fear not, believe. And you see, that is how he is with us. That your faith starts to go down, and he's right in there with you. So, he takes Peter, James, and John. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. All the, there's these professional weepers who are there. And as I say, Matthew says they were flute players. And he says, ah, oh, the girl's only sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. Just shows, you know, crocodile tears all right. And you see his humanity there. They laughed him to scorn. If somebody laughs at you unto scorn, they mock you until you feel terribly embarrassed and maybe you blush. The Lord had our human nature, and that's what happened here. 
but he puts them out and he takes the mum and dad and Peter James and John verse 41, takes the child by the hand and says to her, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, rise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking <clears throat> because she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with amazement. And then he says, give her something to eat. Would you like to give out the uh, bread and the juice, Karim, or something? <clears throat> so, <coughs> this Jesus of yesterday, the Jesus of the Gospels, is the Jesus of today. <laughs> and by taking this bread and this cup, we show our identity with him. But I urge you to go beyond that and to um, and to identify with him as he wants fully by being baptised. And of course, if we're baptised, to live a life of identity with him. So, the bread represents his body, the cup represents his blood or his life. And by taking this, we're saying, Jesus, I want you. I know I'm a sinner, but I want, I want to be with you, and I want to identify with you. So let's, uh, let's give thanks for the bread and for the, for the juice. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you with all our hearts for your Son. You rightly were proud of him, and we are proud of him, and we want deeper connection with him. But this lovely man, Son of God, Lord, Saviour and Master, might be our Lord and our Master and our Saviour, and that we might abide with him and grow to be more like him and live in the atmosphere of his spirit every day. For his sake. Amen. <clears throat>